Hey, how's it going everyone? Ben here. This morning we're gonna be doing quite a bit because I realized I forgot to do my tee shot. So uh, usually my tee shot days are Saturdays, but as I've been on testosterone for over four years, I've been kind of lax with the <laughs> direct days I have to take these tee shots. So I'm gonna do my tee shot and then I have two really big papers due for my end of semester assignments. Um, so I'm gonna work on that. It's a paper and a presentation. So uh, a lot to do today and then I also got to work out because it's workout day. So uh, get ready for a doozy. So this is the first time I've ever really uh, videotaped myself taking my tee shot which is pretty interesting because I've been on this for four years and I still haven't made a video but it's pretty simple. I do a pretty standard technique which I first thing I do is I grab an alcohol wipe and wipe down my skin area on, from one side of the alcohol wipe and then I flip the alcohol wipe and clean out the top of the vial. Also, I definitely have to make sure I have clean hands before I do any of this process to make sure there's no bacteria contamination when I'm doing it. So after I've wiped down my skin and the vial, I wait a couple of seconds and open up my uh, injecting syringe. The injecting syringe already has the needle that I'm going to inject with, but I'm not going to use that needle to draw out the testosterone. I've talked about the double needle method to prevent pain in a previous video. So I use the double needle method every time I draw and insert the testosterone into my thigh. Also, if you're squeamish, feel free to skip this section. But um, you've seen already that I switched out the needle from the package that I initially had. There was some lint on my <laughs> on my vial, so I had to take that out. I'm pretty sure it was my cats. So I, I took that out and then I uh, put in the 16 gauge bigger, wider needle to draw out the testosterone from the vial and it's it's a pretty simple process once i've drawn out the amount that i need i take out the vial and basically pull out uh whatever testosterone that's in the needle i make sure to do that so i don't lose any testosterone and i tap it a couple of times to make sure that there's no bubbles now that i pulled it out i cap this needle that i drew from take it out and then i cap in the needle that I'm going to inject it with, which is much smaller, much tinier, and much easier to inject with. Um, I want to emphasize that in the clinical setting, I would never cap a needle, but because I'm at home, that's that's doable. So then I use the Z-Track method, which is pulling the skin and then inserting the needle to inject. Now, that's another technique I talk about in reducing pain, but it also prevents any fluid from leaking back out once I'm done injecting. So um, I know this looks painful, but today, it, surprisingly, it wasn't that painful at all. It was super easy to do. I make sure to slowly inject. Uh, be, just because sometimes when I uh, when I first started injecting, I wanted to get it over with as quick as possible, but then I realized it created a bit of a mess and more trauma to the area. So I do it in a steady, slow, smooth pace, and then I just add apply pressure with a cotton ball to make sure there's no bleeding. You'll notice that I did not bleed at all in this injection, and I try to rub it in a little to make sure uh, I don't feel any pain. That's like I applied pressure to make sure that. Um, I kind of trick my mind to make sure that I don't experience as pain as I would have if I just, <laughs> you see me rubbing it in a little bit more. Maybe it was a little painful when I injected. It's been a while since I made this recording. But after I'm done, you'll see that there is almost no blood whatsoever in this injection. So then trying to be responsible, I have to dispense the needles. I don't know what my cat is doing. He's just laying down like that. But I have to dispose the uh, needles to a safe biohazard safe container. Make sure there's no puncture. So I put that right in there. And then for the rest of the trash, I just dispose of it in the regular trash bin. Anything that is doesn't need biohazard safety or anything like that. Bye bye. Okay, I'm at my desk and I'm basically ready to get working. I'll probably work for the next two hours, honestly. I'm halfway done with the first research paper and then I have a presentation to prepare. Luckily enough, the presentation, I'm just using old data, putting it on PowerPoint slides and hopefully that should go quickly. I might not get, the, get it done by the time I have to go to the gym, but we'll see. But before I get started, I wanna show y'all something that I've been doing recently and I kind of freaking love it but um recently like if you ha guys don't follow me on instagram but a couple of weeks ago i got really sick like i got really really bad food poisoning and it, it was hard for me to take fluids and when you're sick you just don't want to drink water and usually my choice my drink of choice at that time is gatorade 
But what I started doing is I bought um, these Neo like energy like squirt thingies. I think Kroger has their own brand which is a lot cheaper which is uh, I ended up buying that next. But I added it to my water and it made water taste so good. I, I drink plenty of water. I'm always very hydrated. But it was so tasty and uh, uh, Mio is expensive but the generic brand from Kroger is not so much. I think I'm going to keep buying these more and more. I started working on the project soon after making that last recording and I gotta admit to y'all that it has been a while since I worked on a formal research project. The last time I did a research project was back in March and to be honest it was just a little presentation that I did on a project I worked on the year before. So I started to get my... Uh, gears a little bit more greasy when it comes to doing research. I totally forgot how much of research is less about the writing but more about actually looking up references for every sentence that you make. So I spent a total of maybe two hours on writing this uh, abstract research project like rough draft and I had didn't done like half of it the day before so I did the second half and I spent more time generating tabs to find references for every sentence that I made than I actually did on writing. So that's why you're seeing me basically um, click through the computer more than I am actually typing on the keyboard. It's actually kind of hilarious how research is like that. But I really do enjoy research. I like being able to publish, have my work written out, and you know, people can search it up and learn from the things that I write and then I learn from the things that other people write. I think research is just beautiful whenever it is collectively made to help people instead of create more bias against others. Oh my god, it's been two hours but I finished I finished the manuscript. I finished the first draft of it, sent it in over to my co-authors which are my professors uh, obviously uh, just to get their edit suggestions and hopefully it won't require too many edits. Um, Paper ended up being a little bit less than a thousand words for the body of text, not including the abstract references or any other thing that I had to write, like the cover letter. If y'all don't know about research, you have to do all of that stuff uh, to even have your manuscript looked at and considered for publication. So once I submit that, once I get all the edits in and the edit recommendations in, I submit it to the journal. The journal looks at it and then decides if they're going to approve it or not approve it. I'm hoping, I'm really, really hoping for good luck this year because last year I submitted at least three different abstracts and manuscripts and every single one got rejected and it made me so upset and really unhappy. So I ended up taking a bit of a, a bit of a hiatus from research just because like I just felt like my work wasn't being appreciated but also I want to be realistic that um, these reviewers want good data and I am just in the beginning stages of doing research in my life so maybe maybe I need more experience so I am taking their critiques to heart I just hope that hopefully it gets accepted because funny thing is my first research paper ever got approved and then everything after that just felt like it wasn't it wasn't getting uh, approved that I did independently. So so we'll see. Uh, hopefully hopefully it gets accepted. But now uh, because it took out it took two hours. I'm so glad because that's the kind of time I kind of mentally prepared myself for. So now I'm gonna go to the gym and uh, try to get my workout in. So I just made it to the gym and surprisingly it's sunny in Atlanta today. It has been gloomy and rainy the last two weeks i don't think i've seen the sun in a long long time so i'm really happy to see that the sun is out it's giving me some energy because for some reason when i started heading out uh got into my car to drive to the gym i i was i just got hit with a bunch of fatigue i don't know why uh maybe it's because it's starting to get to lunchtime and my body's like why are you going to the gym right before lunch but I, we're determined to have a good workout like we, we, we have to so I just got done with my workout and surprisingly it was pretty good I did notice like my grip strength wasn't as as powerful as it usually is but I think it's because the last workout I did was actually at a Planet Fitness because my girlfriend has like a black card membership so I, we went and worked out together but for some reason the um, the pull-up bars it always moved my hands to this position so I had to grip extra hard on them so I think my my forearms are still and my forearms and hands are still recovering from that 
but overall it was a really good workout and um the buffest woman i've ever seen in my life approached me to talk to me and i was both intimidated and awe inspired at the same time but she was so cool um i kind of wanted to ask her about her routine and how to and how she got that tone but you know uh i didn't want to be a creep but yeah she was she was very scary but in the most coolest way and um yeah i almost i almost fainted when she was talking to me so after i got home i did some grocery shopping so i put away some of the groceries and i was starving like i always need to eat a big bowl of something after having a good workout so i actually the night before defrosted some of that ground beef stroganoff that i made in a previous vlog about a week ago and um it was surprisingly very very delicious i uh, you'll notice that i did not use the classic pasta uh with people usually eating ground beef stroganoff would but i ate it with this brown rice beans mix that i always make with uh, almost every dish that i cook just to get enough protein and fiber into my diet and even with that it was phenomenally delicious and of course, little baby Jean-Luc had to come and get some cuddles while I was eating. I love him to death, y'all. He's the best decision I ever made in my life. And he always loves cuddles when I come home. And look at him. He's so adorable. He's my little man, my little baby. I also wanted to show y'all in this vlog these nice workout pants that I got from Amazon of all places. I know usually they're really poor quality Chinese uh, brand pants uh, that are often sold on Amazon but these ones are Chinese but they are called Zenwill it's that uh, that's the name of the brand but they are super high quality there are no stray strings or anything when I bought them the quality is so premium I'm, I'm saying this is not a sponsored video I was just so impressed by the quality I needed a cheap long workout pants because all I had were shorts and the weather is getting chillier so I, I, I took a whim and bought them. They were a bit more on the expensive side. They were about 25 to 30 bucks. And for some reason, they also included a warranty card. I have no idea why they would include that, but I thought that was super silly and super fun. But they're super nice quality, and I really, really enjoyed wearing these pants throughout the day. This was my second time wearing them. I also have another pair in black, but I'm definitely going back and buying more of this brand because these pants are just so so comfortable they keep my legs warm and just so stylish hey y'all so we're at the end of the day today and i really really want to end today's vlog with talking about a little bit about the mental health of applying for residency because i often feel like we don't really talk about that i know i've talked about a lot about um, my process and my as a senior in medical school about you know interviewing for programs and you know applying for residency if you don't know what that is is I, i'm gonna give a brief description of what the residency match is because i feel like i've explained this a lot to people who are not in medicine but that's totally totally understandable but i also really want to talk about how it's affecting my mental health because it is um that there's there's no sugar coating it at all and the main reason is because of the fact of how it literally makes you put your life on hold. So the residency match is the system that all medical students have to go through if they want to get um, if they want to be board certified in, in practicing medicine and whatever specialty they want in the United States. And what happens is that um, fourth year medical students, seniors uh, throughout the world and the country apply to the national residency matching program process. I don't know, <laughs> program probably. Um, it's called the N NRMP. And what we do is as I've said, like literally every vlog that I've made so far, I've had a residency interview. But what we end up doing is we interview at these programs that we apply for in the specialty that we want. Uh, for me, I, I'm applying to a specific specialty. I'll reveal it more later after the match. I'm trying to be more ambiguous because a lot of these program directors will also look at my social media. But um, I applied to a bunch of these programs um, and then I interview at them. And in February, I rank the programs I like the most. Let's say I interviewed at 10. I rank my number one and my rank, not my number 10. And these programs also will rank the candidates they interview. So they rank their number one. 
to their number, whatever it is that they, let's say they interview 20, 35, and they have this computer algorithm that matches all the medical students together uh, on March 17th of this year, uh, and uh, we match. The thing about the match is that it's completely unpredictable. We have no idea uh, where we're headed, unless unless you decide to only apply um, at the state or city that you're at, which is very, very risky, um, depending on the specialty. So the specialty I'm, I'm applying, there's only two residencies <laughs> in Atlanta and maybe like six in Georgia, but they're not in Atlanta. They're within two to three hours of Atlanta. And um, in, in full transparency, a lot of my interviews are out of the state. So I've been having to really weigh in on the fact that I might be traveling over 500 miles, uh, depending on how my cards are played and the random C, the random C <laughs> of the match. I might end up in uh, halfway across the country um, in July. So I have from March to July to figure out where I'm going to move. I have to figure out how I'm going to move my things here in, in Atlanta to a completely new city. And it's going to be super, super expensive. The match already has cost me around $2,000 to apply to the programs that I did apply to. Um, and now I have to think about making enough money for a potential move. I, I can't just get rid of all my stuff and start new at a new city because I have stuff that I, I paid a lot of money for. Like I just got an air fryer. So I have to think about spending at least three to seven thousand dollars on a potential move, depending on you know the economy. Everything's more expensive now, is and even movers are more expensive now. And then I have to think about putting my life on pause for almost eight months, not knowing where I'm headed. I have to figure out thinking about how am I going to get make friends in a new city? How am I going to keep in touch with family in a new city? How am I going to find rent in a new city? What places of this new city are rentable and safe for me to rent in? So these are all things that are in the back of my mind. Fourth year, my fourth year in med school, although I'm not doing a lot of clinical work, I am very, very, very stressed just because of the fact that I have no control of my life until I figure out where I'm headed. And it's, it's December right now. So I, I have until March to know where I'm going. So um, it's 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 taking a lot of stress and headspace in my life. And I've talked to other people and they feel the same way. It's just, we're basically stuck in purgatory until this this algorithm tells us where we're headed. And it's hard. And a lot of these programs, they don't have the funding to give us moving stipends. And if they do, it's only about maybe five hundred to a thousand dollars, which which is doable if it's a neighboring city or neighbor neighboring state. But let's say I end up in California, which which could be a probability. I like the programs in California, and that's <laughs> I mean Atlanta on the East Coast, and that's completely on the West Coast. So um, that is to say that like. This entire process, med school as a whole, is very hard. And every time when people tell me it's going to get easier, it's not. I feel like there's more stress or, or a different type of stress that I have to experience regarding each year that I go through my training. And I know uh, in every single vlog and every single video, I'm going to talk about the stress I go through. But I feel like this is often not talked about, about the kind of mental stress and weight that medical, fourth year medical students have to go through as far as waiting on results for a residency match, figuring out if they have enough interviews to get a match because some people don't match at all and then they have to put their life in pause again for another year. It's honestly a system built to not favor the medical student, not favor the trainee. And I hope one day it gets easier. I know it's going to take a long time, maybe past my time. Um, but I just really, really wanted to be vulnerable and honest about this process. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this vlog. I hope um, you gained something from this stuff that I've sh been able to like show you as part of the experience of my life. And um, I hope y'all have a great uh, holiday season. Um, I'm actually recording this bit a little bit later 
Then I filmed the day vlogging just because my cat scraped against the camera and totally messed up the original, <laughs> the original um, clip that I made for this. And uh, my grandmother passed away, uh, which has been kind of weighing on my mind, but um, this holiday season. But I'm glad she's at peace now. My family, my parents are coming back on Christmas Day and um, I'm ready to spend some time with them. Uh, because I don't know where I'm going to be headed in March and whether or not they're going to be hundreds of miles away from me. So I love you all. Uh, have a great holiday season. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Kwanzaa. A Merry Christmas and um, anything else that you might celebrate. And I'll see you all in the next vlog. Mwah. This is Ben.